Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is Ann, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm your substitute. I hope I don't bore you. If anybody falls asleep, I want you to snore quietly, please. I don't want to get a resentment. Uh, one of the things that I would like to do uh, before I get into my story here is to read just a, a paragraph from one of the uh, box 459s that I, I'm really impressed with. Let's see if I can let's see if I can read it up here in the dark. Last night I confidently escorted a frightened newcomer to the meeting room where I had sobered up some years ago. The speaker was a young woman who qualified for roughly 40 minutes about her childhood, her teens, her parents, and her experiences with cocaine, sex, and more sex, and nearly every word was prefaced by a choice expletive. The only thing a newcomer could have taken away from that room was an expanded four-word vocabulary and the resolve to stay away from AA meetings. This really impressed me, uh, because I, I, I too, agree with the lady who wrote this letter. Uh, I'm trying to clean up my act. I hope I I stay clean tonight. Uh, From the podium, I think it's very important that we watch our language. Well... So you guys help me, and if I say something bad, you can wave your finger at me, okay? Uh, I'd like to tell you, know, uh, you can never change the the first part of your story. It's there, and it's always there. I just, you know, sometimes I tell one thing, and sometimes I tell another. But after we've gotten into Alcoholics Anonymous, we've, uh, you know, our experiences are are, uh, very important, and, and every year we get more experience. And I've got a lot of experience, let me tell you. A lot of experience. Uh, I'm now living with my seventh husband. I'll tell you something about experience. Um, but uh, way back when, uh, I, I grew up in, in, uh, in the southern part of the United States. And uh, I was reared by a rather strict mother. My father was away from home a great deal. And I was the only daughter in a family of five. Um, my childhood was not particularly eventful. Uh, the only thing is that uh, my mother and I did not have a very good relationship. She was not a very nice woman to me in many ways. And it was pretty obvious in our family that she thought very highly of my oldest brother and my youngest brother. And the three of us in between were just sort of afterthoughts. Uh, that was something I had to deal with later, and that's okay. Uh, but uh, being a parent isn't easy, and I understand that. At any rate, I um, I grew up in a, sort of a rigid household. I uh, was told, you know, you don't uh, gamble and you, you don't uh, uh, fool around with sex. Sex was a dirty word. Uh, playing cards and, and a lot of stuff you didn't do. Uh, what you did do was learn to be industrious and thrifty and courteous and gracious and all those things. Uh, my mother really tried to make a lady out of me, which reminds me, have you ever seen a drunk lady? <laughs> I have never, I've seen many drunk females, but I've never seen a drunk lady. Um, I've often thought about that. Anyway, uh, I grew up in this small town and, uh, a war came along. Now, most of you probably think I'm talking about the war between the states, but I'm not. I'm talking about old WW2. Uh, everybody knew about it at the time. It was in all the papers. Anyway, um, I, that's when I met uh, the man of my dreams. Now, I was drinking already at this time. I'd uh, working in, uh, in a war industry effort, and uh, I met a handsome young Yankee from New York City and the uh, Air Corps, and I just knew that this was the answer to my prayer, and uh, we were going to get married, and we are going to, uh, you know, be like a fairy tale, we are going to live happily ever after, and honey, let me tell you right now, that's a fairy tale. 
uh, I didn't realize this then. He was everything that I thought I needed and I wanted. And actually, I did not realize at the time that we went together, and because we did a lot of drinking together, but I still was maintaining uh, my job and, and taking care of everything. What the hell is young then? You know, and I'm full of uh, vim and vigor and could bounce back pretty easily. But my husband at that time actually had, was already a full-blown alcoholic, but I didn't even know what the word was. At any rate... Uh, his drinking got progressively worse, and I kept pointing a lot of fingers to this, at this man and, and talking about how bad it was. And I'm going to be kind of brief about this. But, uh, you know, he Bob drove me crazy. And uh, I tried to do all sorts of things for him. Uh, I thought seriously of uh, a murder. Uh, <clears throat> that crossed my mind more than once. I... Um, I wanted to kind of to do him in when we had the insurance premium paid up on his life, but uh, our ours was a bumpy bumpy life, and we rarely could pay keep insurance premiums paid. Hell, we were doing good to pay the rent. Uh, two booze habits in one family is pretty hard, and especially when only one person works, and that was me. Uh, at any rate, uh, one of my favorite uh, themes. Uh, as far as doing him in, I kept thinking if I could catch him passed out sometime, I'd like to pour hot lead in his ear. I, um, you can see what a charming person I was. A, a cheerful and loving wife. But it was very easy for me to point the finger to my husband because, uh, he was much, uh, had progressed much further down the road of alcoholism than I had. And, uh, it's so much easier to point out other people's faults. Have you noticed that? It's so much simpler to say how bad they are and how good you are. You know, if they're real bad, that makes you look good. And uh, this was what I was doing. Uh, eventually, he had to go to uh, uh, say good morning judge about something he had done. He'd had an encounter with the law. And uh, prior to uh, an arraignment, he went to an AA meeting and pleaded to the, with the judge that he was a poor, sick alcoholic, and the judge bought it. And he got sent away for a short time. I'm really kind of condensing this story. I'm not telling you all the good things that happened to us. Uh, like when my little five-year-old daughter cut my husband's arm with a knife because he was choking me, and the police came, and my little daughter was so frightened because, you know, she really loved her father. She was only trying to protect her mother, and she didn't know what to do. Uh, this is the kind of household that we lived in. This is the kind of hurt that we inflicted on our children. And uh, I want you to understand that I, what I often tried to tell people is that nobody loved their children any more than we alcoholics do, but somehow we can't seem to do the things when we're in our cups that we're supposed to do and to be responsible for these children. And I guess that's one reason why the guilt is so bad for us. At any rate, my husband uh, was sent away for a short while, and I, I was sort of relieved because he got on my nerves. Every time I'd stagger down to the bar two blocks away, I'd, I thought he was passed out on his bottle of wine, uh, and I looked down my nose at him because he was a wino. And... Uh, I'd look up in the mirror, and there's the son of a gun be standing behind me, and I have to buy him a drink. And I, I mean, I found it most annoying. Uh, I did love to go to bars. That's where they had the, those dim lights and those jukeboxes that played all those crazy songs. I really liked Ace in the Hole. Uh, I'd, I'd like to read all those labels back there. I like those old things. I always liked old men and old money and old whiskey. <laughs> And they had old Taylor and old Quaker and the old Crow and all those old Fitzgeralds and all those old things, you know. And I mean, uh, somehow that kind of turned me on. I got to tell you something that I, uh, you, I take that one drink, that first drink, and God, it feels good going down. Uh, I got so much smarter. I got taller. My bust grew 44 inches. <laughs> I was a real swinger, honey. I'm telling you that booze can do wonderful things for you. But sometimes it turns on you, doesn't it? Because it sure turned on me. 
But at any rate, I'm trying to tell you how I got to A. My husband, when he got out of jail, came home, and I bought a fifth of whiskey and had it sitting on the cotton t- coffee table, and he was drinking out of my bottle, and he says, you know, Ann, you better go down to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I was uh, brought up right, you know. I- I'm a lady, and uh, I'm also a snob and a slob. Anyway, I was I just couldn't believe that this man who'd just gotten out of jail told me I should go to AA. I couldn't believe that this was what he was doing. A guy who couldn't keep a job. Uh, you know, he uh, he couldn't uh, do so many things. And he was always in there with his damn wine bottles, hiding them and all that jazz. You know, and I couldn't understand this. And he was telling me I should go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I drew myself up and I said, let me tell you something, Buster. If you want to go down there and fool around with all those drunks, feel free. But that's not for me. That was in May. In June, <laughs> I, here we go, you know, God, there I was. I was on my way to work one day. I was on crutches, and I worked in, I lived in the East Bay, and I worked in San Francisco. And I, at that time, we rode the old key system bus. We got off at the key system terminal, and instead of catching my other bus and going to work, I stopped and stepped across the street to a bar and started drinking. And I drank all day, I guess, because I was in a blackout when I came to that night, and I was on a bus headed back across the bridge. So I don't know what happened to that day. And I, this was about a Wednesday or a Thursday, I don't know. I uh, got off the bus in Richmond, not at my stop, walked across the street to the liquor store and bought a bottle. I stuck it in my purse, called a cab, and went out to one of the gin mills I'd been frequenting there. Now, this was in San Pablo, and I want to tell you, I live in San Pablo. That's the armpit of the Bay Area. And you sh- you haven't lived till you've been drunk in some of those dives in San Pablo. The bad part about that thing is when I looked back two years prior, I was such a, a, a smart ass. I mean, I only drank at the St. Francis Hotel and all the fancy joints in San Francisco, not... But you see that uh, what drinking did to me, it brought me into the joints in San Pablo. And so that's where I went. I had broken my toe and I was on crutches. And I was dragging those crutches around with me. About three days later, I think it was, at any rate, I woke up in a strange place. And I've told you, my mother always tried to rear me in the, in the correct manner. Uh, she wanted me to do the right thing. And as I, when I woke up and I saw this person next to me, I said, who in the hell are you? Now, my mother would not have approved of us not being properly introduced. <laughs> but somehow that was my moment of truth. And that's the day I said I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous because that wasn't the first time this had happened to me. And I didn't like the idea of my life being out of control. I didn't like the idea that I didn't know when to go home. I had children, two children at home, and I had been gone for several days. I don't know how long. And um, the very, I, I felt so uh, degraded. I felt so humiliated. I felt so, so dirty, and I didn't want to be that kind of a person. And for some reason or other, that's the time that something said to me in my head, it's time to do something. And that's the day I went into Alcoholics Anonymous. I would like to tell you that I have been sober from that day since, but I have not, because I only stayed sober for six months when I decided to get drunk at my husband. That sucker got drunk first. We were both going to meetings, and I came home, found him drunk, and I thought, I'll show you. I mean, I've done this before. I've been drunk at him before, and I got drunk at him again. But I'll tell you, that only lasted about two months. That drinking, and I was so miserable, and I knew where I belonged. I knew the place that I should be, where people understood what I was all about, where I understood about them, where people loved for me and cared for me, and so I went in back into Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was in February of 1955. And AA has been wonderful for me, and it's given me many opportunities. I have five children. Uh, I believed in indoor sports. Uh, I have a wonderful relationship with four of my children. I have the fifth child who is out there doing his thing, doing things that I don't care for. 
Uh, I hope someday he finds this program. And I hope that you keep this program as it should be kept because I want it ready for him should he decide that he wants to change his life and ready for my grandchildren if they need this program when they come along. Uh, I've had so many wonderful experiences in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I learned so much in AA, and I hope that I continue to learn as I, as long as I live and as long as I'm a part of AA, I feel sure that there are things that I can learn. I'm a great believer in service. I happen to be the outgoing GSR for my home group at the present time. I uh, have done a lot of service over the past 35 years, and all of it has meant so much to me and has enhanced my sobriety, I feel sure. I'm also a great believer in sponsorship. Three of my daughters went through Alateens. The oldest one is now 42 years old. That'll tell you something. Uh, I, I love Alateens because it meant so much to my family. And it meant, uh, it meant a great deal to, to the growth of my three daughters. I um, firmly believe in, in, in Alanine, Alanon, and AA. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't care much for diluting my program by attending every other damn 12-step program there is in the country. I think that I can be intent on what's wrong with me and learn how to do whatever it is I need to do by coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I see we have some right-thinking people in here. You know how that goes. Do like I do, <laughs> and I like it. Anyway, uh, these are my opinions, and I'm stuck with them, and I don't intend to hurt anybody's feelings, but I, I really feel that these are things that I have to say and that should be said. I... Um, I think that uh, we have to be careful what we do. Uh, my daughter, who is now 30-something years old, about four years ago, she and I got into a little spat, and it was highly unusual for us to to uh, have words. We we get along beautifully together, and and we both felt bad, and then both of us started doing the tenth step right away. And I had just moved back from Reading after living eight years in the Reading. I just moved back to the Bay Area again, and uh, after we'd apologized to each other for our words, she said to me, do you have a sponsor? And I said, well, uh, uh, yeah. she said, I think you need a sponsor. And I said, well, since I've moved back, I, you know, I, I'm, all, I'm here, I am on the defensive. This kid was not even born when I got sober. But, you know, I needed to hear what she had to say. So I packed my bags and went to see my sponsor who lived in Reading. And this is what I need at various and sundry times. Now, I don't call my sponsor every day, but when I need her, by golly, I go. And this is one of the things I'd like to talk about, too. I, somehow or another, I cannot see how a man can sponsor a woman. I just don't see how they can do. I've got a friend that just had three miscarriages. I don't think a man knows a damn thing about miscarriages. You know that? I, I, you see, I, you gotta, I get tickled about the skit you had up here about the old timer. You know, you got all this sobriety, you know everything. And Marie got tired of hearing me saying, well, in the old days. <laughs> but I do think some of what I have to say is valid. Or at least maybe I can make somebody think about some of the things that I feel strongly about. And maybe if I'm wrong, you'll correct me after this meeting is over. But I want to tell you that this program has sustained me through many, many bad things in my life. A great many of which was divorce. But it's also sustained me through disease. And it's sustained me through the deaths of some of my family members. And it's sustained me through so many things. And I find that with this program, I can cope with anything that comes down the pike. I recently came back from a trip to Russia, and Marie has asked me to exchange, uh, to share some of the things uh, with you about my Russian trip. And frankly, I've been doing a lot of speaking lately, and everybody wants to hear about Russia. I usually can fill up the whole damn thing with Russia. Uh, but I, 
I wanted you to know that I really belong in this room because I am powerless over alcohol. At any rate, uh, in, in a moment of insanity, I volunteered to become the recording secretary for the area PICPC group. Uh, hi, Steve. <laughs> I, um, I kept seeing the, the notice that they needed a secretary, recording secretary, and I, 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 I just feel there's so much that I need to do for Alcoholics Anonymous, and so I volunteered for that job. And that's how I heard about the, the trips that, that were being made to Russia to carry the message to the alcoholics in the, in the USSR. Uh, one of the members showed up one day at our committee meeting and was talking about it, and my Lord, he was high as a Georgia pine. He was, just couldn't come down from that trip from Russia, and I was absolutely entranced. So I immediately asked him if he had any uh, literature on it, and he handed me a poster, and I took it home. And I laid it in front of old number seven. And I said, look here, honey, look, we could, this, you could go to Russia. And uh, he read it, and he says, well, why don't you go? I'll pay for it. And I thought, I just love that man. I <laughs> I like to spend his money and save mine. <laughs> At any rate, this is how I... But the funny thing about this is I, I usually walk about three miles every morning. And, and I, this is when I do my meditating. And this is when I talk a lot to God and ask Him for guidance and complain and worry and whatever. But anyhow, this is my 11th step time. And then I got to worrying about why am I going to Russia? Are my motives right? Because I'm a real stickler for methods and motives, you know. What is your motive? Is it a good one? And what method are you doing to get your, to make your motive come true? So it bothered me, and I, be, I was concerned about it. And I thought, well, who am I going to talk to about this? i got to talk to somebody about whether I should go to Russia or not, really. And uh, I thought of a lady who happens to be my hairdresser, and she has nothing to do with Alcoholics Anonymous. But she is a very spiritual lady, and I have a lot of respect for her. So I went to see her, and I explained it to her. And I said, you know, I just want to be sure I'm doing this for the right thing, that it's not my ego that's doing this, that it's, this, I'm doing it for all the right reasons. And she said something to me that's so simple. She said, Ann, it looks to me like God put this in your path. Now, I'm stupid. I don't think of simple things like that. And, and I mean, this is, you know, I, I can get help from a lot of people. And this made me feel better. And I think, yes, I believe God did put this trip in my path. And so I proceeded with all the preparations to go to Russia. There were 24 of us in our group. We went uh, for two weeks. We had orientations. We tried to uh, learn uh, uh, phrases in the, in the Russian language. Uh, I was telling somebody here tonight that the first... Uh, Russian meeting I went to, I sat down by a man in the, in the meeting and said, Kokkala, that means how are you? And he turned around and says, oh, you speak Russian, and it scared the hell out of me, and I never said another word of Russian <laughs> the whole time I was there. But anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit about, we were such a mixed group. Uh, of our group, two, we had two al ladies, one from Oregon and one from Oklahoma. Uh, most of us were from California. Uh, most of us from Northern California, a few people from Southern California, and a few other people scattered over the United States. And I'd like to, we just became a family in that two weeks. It was just wonderful the way we melded together and looked after each other. Uh, one of the things that we did, we had a, a WOD, they call it. That's a W-O-D. And he or she, whoever was appointed WOD, was the worrier of the day. And he had to count noses and see if we were all there and who was going to what meeting and who was going to this meeting. And it was really great because you always knew who the woad was because he's always going around. One, two, three, two, three. Uh, we also had a sod, and a scribe of the day, S-O-D. And that was a person who kept a journal about what happened in that particular day. It also so happens that we arrived in Moscow during the holiday for the uh, revolution, the Russian Revolution. It had been 73 years since the communists took over and they threw out the czar. And I'm sure you've all seen these things on TV. I have many times where Khrushchev or Stalin or somebody standing up there reviewing the troops and the missiles and the tanks and all that jazz. Well, I didn't feel too well, and I didn't care to go down to Red Square and see this and see Gorby. 
And, uh, but uh, a number of our group did go. And uh, after they had the parade, one of the things that can now happen in Russia, which is highly unusual, is that they had a protest march. And uh, so the protesters marched after the parade. And uh, we've got some free spirits in Alcoholics Anonymous, and two of our group marched with the protest. <laughs> uh, Alkies will do anything, won't they? Uh, we had a marvelous young interpreter who accompanied us to all of the cities that we went to. And uh, it really was kind of funny because he really caught on to the AA lingo. We had to speak in sort of kindergarten-type language or really plain, unadulterated English. And we'd say a phrase, and the interpreter would say it, repeat it, and we'd say a phrase, and he'd repeat it. And uh, couldn't use any colloquialisms and a lot of the phrases that you and I know exactly what it means that are not easily translatable. And uh, we... uh, we went to these meetings, and, and, and we would split up. Not all of the group would go at all places. Now, our little old two Al-Anons, God love them, they were in there just searching and, and working and seeking out Al-Anons and doing all that jazz. And there are about 19 groups now in Russia. And like all good Alkies, they're feuding a little bit among themselves. Uh, they welcomed us. It, it was so beautiful. They, they were so happy to see us and the warmth and the feelings that we got were just unbelievable. Uh, if they knew we were coming, the ones that were on the program who knew some of the people who'd been there before would be at the airport with flowers or flags or some little gift, some token. We were, uh, it, the feeling was overwhelming that happened to us in Russia. I, um, I was, uh, I finally decided after I got home I must have been the comic relief of the whole bunch. Uh, but at any rate, I was also the head snapper, because if I talked, I'd say, and through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Arcadi would translate it, I said, I've been sober for 35 years, and start translating it. When they say 35, the head snapped, you know, to look at me again, to be sure, you know, that this old old bag was still alive and breathing. Because in Russia... Sobriety is in very short supply. If you're two years sober, you're a real old-timer there. And it's nothing for three months to be considered really a solid. They, to me, uh, I would judge that AA is almost in this, in Russia, it's almost like it was here 55 years ago. Uh, there is one exception. Uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Wilson had his town's hospital, but when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, the medical profession would not treat us. We were hard put to find a doctor who would even look at us or make a call on us or, or do any of it. They just didn't want to fool with alcoholics. And when we find, it finally could bring them into the county hospitals, they were not accepted with glee, let me tell you. You, could sit on, you had to sit on a sucker for three hours before they decided to put them in the hospital. So, but here the uh, uh, medical profession is really welcoming uh, AA members, and they are interested in how the treatment centers operate in the United States. They, uh, this to me was one of the most heartwarming things that, that I had seen, was that the doctors were really interested in what we had to say. And some of our group, I did not go, went to hospital number 16. Hospital number 16 is in Moscow, and it's a 6,000-bed hospital for alcoholics. Now, if that's 16, I don't know what the hell's going on in the first 15. But anyway, uh, 6,000, you know, well, they say what? One out of 10, and I think there are 9 million people in Moscow, so that must mean at least 900,000 alkies, and we do know that alcoholism is pretty bad in Russia. I would like to tell you a little bit about Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin came to our hotel in Moscow and wanted some of us to go to the group that he was interested in. Now, Benjamin was not an alcoholic. And uh, he came, and about four or five of us, I can't recall how many, decided we would go with Benjamin to the anti-Bacchus group, which struck me as a rather humorous name, but then it fits, I guess. So uh, we got in the uh, subway, and Russia does have a wonderful subway system. And we rode for a long time on the car, on the train, and we got off of that, and we got on another train, we rode for a long time on that train, and we got off of that, and we got on another train, we rode for a long time on that train. 
And we, I think it was four trains we rode on. Finally, we went, we went up topside uh, and caught a bus and rode a few blocks and got off and walked two or three blocks to this meeting. And uh, Benjamin was our um, interpreter. He spoke English beautifully, much better than I do. Uh, and uh, when I saw him, he came to see us off at the airport because, remember, he had to come and get us and take us to the meeting, and then he had to take us back to the hotel and go all the way back to where he lived. Now, that takes a long time, folks, on all those subway trains. And I told him, I said, uh, Benjamin, I think it's so nice of you that you would do those things, and it's really important because you had to do a lot of traveling here just to get us to the meeting. And he said to me, I made up my mind six months ago I was going to, to devote the rest of my life to Alcoholics Anonymous. He has a son who needs this program. And I thought that was a marvelous thing to hear from this guy. I mean, he was so sincere and he was so warm and he's so so loving and certainly so dedicated. At any rate, we left uh, Moscow, which is a bleak and ugly place, desolate and decaying. Yeah, a lot of buildings had... Uh, scaffolding around them and our interpreter told us that it was nothing for them to put up scaffolding around a building start to uh, um, maybe do something to maintain it or repair it and the scaffolding would remain there for years uh, Moscow was decorated with these huge banners of linen and uh, the red flags in celebration of the revolution we went from Moscow to Sochi which is a seaport town on the Black Sea and also a resort town and uh, this this was a wonderful experience too uh, one of the things I'd like to tell you is you ain't going to gain any weight eating their food you're alright if you like cabbage and beets um, thank God the Moscow hotel was not too swift and they got better as we went along but at any rate we went to Sochi and here, we had a wonderful experience there at least I felt it was wonderful uh, we went into um, a dispensary or a clinic, or whatever you want to call it, uh, alcoholics. Nothing but men, incidentally. And you saw very few women in the AA groups, very few. But this was a hospital just filled with men. And uh, we held a meeting there. When we came in, the patients there were in their, their pajamas, and they handed us uh, ladies a long-stemmed chrysanthemum when we came in. It's a welcoming gesture. And uh, one of our, our members held, uh, chaired the meeting, and he called on various ones of us and uh, to talk. And uh, he called on me about the third time, I guess. And I'm so intent. I don't know whether you've noticed it, but there's a little body English that goes on up here when I talk. Um, I, and I was so intent in trying to get this message through and I, I was doing a lot of pantomiming as well when I when I spoke. And I said, when I drank, I was miserable. And uh, the bad things happened to me. And I, sp I said something about I would catch what I would wake up in strange places with strange men. And I said, when I joined out, and I, you know, I'd stop each phrase and get the translation. And I'd say, and when I joined Alcoholics Anonymous, and began to try to practice this program, good things began to happen to me. And I no longer have to slash my wrists. And my, the, Arkady was saying, in Russian, and we came, when he came to that, he looked up at me and he said, You did that! <laughs> but at any rate, I, I was so touched because after I sat down, one of the men who had been standing in the hall in his pajamas listening to what was being said came back in, and he was carrying a branch that had four large persimmons on it. Evidently, he'd gone out in the yard and picked it. And he told the interpreter, pass it to me, because he said, I was the most honest woman he'd ever heard in his life. <laughs> but you understand what he's saying, because they've never heard people stand up and bear their souls about their alcoholism before. And it's a wonderful thing when you remember that it's only been in recent, say, two years that people were allowed to even assemble for a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was not allowed in Russia as we knew it then. 
So I was very touched by his gift of the four persimmons. And he thought I was an honest woman. And uh, we established uh, a meeting, an AA meeting and an Al-Anon meeting in the, in the town, in the city of Sochi in Russia. And we felt very good when we left there. Uh, we had things going. And the doctor who helped us uh, was in charge of that particular clinic. And I, I, I walked up to him and I told him how wonderful I thought it was that he was looking at what Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer. And he just seemed very touched that I, that I felt, you know, I expressed my feelings that he'd done, he was doing something and something that I felt was good. Uh, from Sochi, we went to Odessa, which is another city on the Black Sea. It was a beautiful city. And we went to an AA meeting there. Uh, <laughs> and we, this meeting was held in the Seamans Club. This is a seaport town. And, uh, you may not believe this, but I don't always get up and run off at the mouth. But um, at, we had one fellow there who was close to my age. He was a few years older. You know, I'm old. Do you know this time next week I'll reach my 69th birthday? It's amazing I've lived this long. And when you stop to think of it, it's not the real me up here. I've been lifted, amputated, implanted, uh, bonded, slashed. But this is what you got, kids. Anyway, we went to this this uh, meeting in the Siemens Club. And, uh, you know, the husband that I spoke about that was instrumental in my going to Alcoholics Anonymous uh, was a man who went to sea. And... Uh, Different ones volunteered, and I'm sitting there, and I look at my friend John. John had 31 years of sobriety, and he's a man about my age, and uh, a person that I was kind of close to on the trip. If I had something I wanted to kind of talk about, well, I'd go to John and talk to him about it. And uh, we we pretty much think along the same lines, and, and he this was his second trip to Russia. But I happened to look over to where John was sitting, and he was giving me this get up, get up and talk motion. And I looked over and I said, me? You want me to get up and talk? Yeah, he's giving me this motion. So I jumped up. Well, I had to tell him this little story about my husband being a seaman because we had an old salty sea dog sitting there. Here he was with his coat with the brass buttons, etc. and I'm sure he had gone to say, uh, if not now, certainly in uh, past years. And I, so I started telling him the story about my husband. Because my husband had uh, uh, gone to sea, and at one time he brought home some samurai swords, and these swords were on the wall. And I was trying to get this through and pause so that Arcadi could translate this. And I said, and we had a duel. And Arcadi said, what? And I said, you know a duel. And I'm going like this and pointing and jabbing and switching my hips around trying to get the message through us. But the only thing about this is my husband got his sword off the wall and got between me and my sword. So it was pretty damned unfair. And what happened? The cops came. I went to the hospital and my husband went down to the corner bar and had another drink. At any rate, when I finished my story, I said, and a day at a time since I've come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been able to stay sober for 35 years. And this was, you know, big, big deal to these guys. Not big deal to me, folks, to tell you. But this old sea dog reached across three people and grabbed me and just hugged me and kissed me. He just was so happy for me. I think especially because I was married to a sea. But, <laughs> and we saw him the next night when we went to a little town and he brought me a beautiful gift. The Russians do love to give gifts. They give you little pens and little things, postcards and things of that nature. And we took a lot of gifts over and gave to them, and especially gifts for children that we'd see on the streets. And and it was such a, a such a rewarding and wonderful atmosphere. I can't really express to you what this trip meant to me, except to tell you that I was told that this would be a life-changing experience, and truly it was. It was truly a life-changing experience. We uh, went to Odessa. We had those meetings. We went to Ilichev, had meetings. Uh, in Ilichev, it was fantastic. The whole group got on a bus 
and we drove to Ilichev, it was about 40 miles. And the, the group there had this beautiful table set up, they knew we were coming, with flowers on the table, uh, they have tons and tons of hot tea that they serve, and a lot of sweet cakes that are always on the table. And uh, I'm going to mention this little thing because I think it's so important. One of the things that we heard asked so many times is, how can we do as you do? You talk about God. We've been brought up in an atheistic society. We know nothing about this. Well, folks, how many people do you know that's coming today and don't believe in God? You know, claim to be atheists. Uh, this, I think, was uh, prevalent in their minds because of their background. But to many of us, we thought, we've seen a lot of atheists come into Alcoholics Anonymous. And they asked a lot of questions about the 11th step. And they had meetings on the 11th step. But they were in there pitching and trying, and that's what's wonderful. At any rate, one of the guys asked about spirit and God. And about that time, uh, one of the Russians uh, I started to say, I want to respond to that. But my friend Bruce said, let me answer that. And he stood up. And I want to tell you what Bruce said. He said, being spiritual and godlike is knowing inside what you're supposed to do. Knowing how you're supposed to act. It's something that comes from within. And to illustrate, he said, I come from California. And in California, uh, actually way up in Alaska, there's uh, herds of whales who migrate every year right down the coast to Mexico where they have their young. And then when they do that, at a certain time of the year, they migrate back up to Alaska. And this is the spirit within them that tells them what to do. That's that herd instinct as well as the instinct that this is the way we're supposed to act. But he said, we, you know, not unlike me, we have a whale named Humphrey who does strange things. Humphrey decides his way is best. And Humphrey goes against the instinct of doing the right thing. And he gets into the bay and he gets himself in trouble and he gets on a, on a, a dirt and a mud banks and we have to push him and help him and do all these things to try to get him back to where he belongs. And he said, you know, Humphrey's done that twice. And he says, but Humphrey had better listen to what's inside. And I thought that was a beautiful analogy about the spirit within. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the things to tell you that you might... Oh, huh. let me tell you about Aeroflot. Let me tell you about Russian Airlines. Because I think you may find this amusing. I have a son-in-law who's a pilot, and I told him about it today. We got on one huge plane, and in Russia, you don't get on a plane from the airport. You're bussed out to the tarmac, and... Uh, you get off the bus and then you board the plane. And we were boarded first in every almost every instance. And one of the planes, the first plane we got on was one of these big planes. Now, folks, I don't know the names of these fuckers. But anyway, uh, it, we had to go through the cargo to get into the place where we sat. And they were huge, uh, you know, the big three seats on each side and in the middle about, what, eight seats, I think it is. So we went to our assigned seat. And some of the backs would not stay up, and the death, the trays would not uh, always stay up, and this, then they wouldn't always come down, and there were wires coming out of the seat in front of me, and there were bare wires coming back in the back, and one of the girls says, Arcati, I only have half a seat belt, and his reply was, do you have a problem with that? <laughs> I don't know, and I get the idea that they don't really have a time schedule as we do, because you sit there, it seems like, for a long time before you decide to take off. We had a lot of graveyard humor going on that trip, let me tell you. At any rate, a, a, a second plane that we got on was almost as humorous. It was a smaller plane, and we, we sat two seats, and we were sitting on the tarmac again. Uh, in this particular instance, we had one passenger too many, so three guys occupied two seats. But at any rate... While we were sitting there waiting for this plane to take off, 
Uh, this guy comes down the aisle, he lifts up the carpet, lifts up the floorboard part, goes down with screwdrivers and wrenches, and he's working on the plane while we're sitting there in the airport ready to take off. <laughs> there was a, they were inclined to make some people nervous, I think. But, you know, we crazy Americans, we're singing songs and doing all those things, uh, singing Christmas songs and religious songs and Beatles songs and all those things because we were together and we welded together as a beautiful family. I have found 23 new friends that, believe me, mean a great deal to me. Uh, I, <laughs> when I came home, unfortunately I had a sick spell and it took me about a week to get over it. But, um, you know, I want to go back. I want to go again. And they have these trips all the time. And I don't know whether this old body can take it or not. But I bet I go. Don't you? Yeah, I bet I go. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I believe that anyone who gets up at a podium, as I say, tells only one part of, you know, one story about how you get here. You can't change how you got to Alcoholics Anonymous. You can tell a lot about your experiences after you got here. And they should change because you, we do have these experiences. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something tonight that I, I have to say, and I've only been able to say it once before, but I think it's something I need to talk about. This time last year I was in a terrible shape. For the most part, I'm a very happy, joyous, free person. My life is a, like a bowl of cherries. I enjoy it. I go places. I do things. I believe in feeling good. Why else would I have my face lifted? Um, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I like to be good to myself because now I like me. This is a far cry from the person I was when I came in here when I hated me. But now I like me now, and I'm feeling pretty comfortable, and I enjoy life. And I thought, you know, I raised five kids almost alone. And I thought most of my troubles were behind me. That all the bad things in my life, like disease and divorce and destruction and divorce and death and divorce and so on, I thought they'd all happen to me. Because old number seven's pretty good and life's pretty good. And I was feeling pretty comfortable. But November a year ago, my telephone rang, and it was my oldest daughter, and she said to me, Mom, i got to tell you something, and it's not good. And I could tell from the sound of her voice that it wasn't good. So I said, okay, let me have it. And she said, Mom, and she named my granddaughter, my only granddaughter. And she said, we found out she's been molested by her mother's girl boyfriend. This incident just about tore my family apart. My daughter was in hysterics. All three of my daughters were in hysterics. Um, we, were, we were so torn with this, this incident. And... Uh, I'm telling you this because I'm telling you that this is what has affected my life. And it made me feel so bad. And we had to go through a lot of things to get my daughter's child back with her. She had to, we had to prove to the state that she was not aware of this. But one of the things that happened in this interim when we were trying to do this, in fact, the next day when we went to try to see this child, we were talking to the... Uh, counselor or whatever you call it about the child we want to know about where she was when we could see her what we could do and the woman said to me and there I was with my three daughters and she said to us have you any of you ever been abused or molested and we all said no except my daughter's my granddaughter's mother and she said I have and my two daughters and I were totally astounded. And then I found out it was one of my husbands who had molested my daughter approximately 18 years ago. 
this was a blow to me because I've always tried so hard to take care of my children. I worked two jobs. I wanted so badly for them to feel that they were loved and protected. It not only was a blow to me, from that moment I began to have some strange feelings about my friends, my male friends. And you know, I've been on this program a long time and I've had a lot of good male friends. But I said to one of them one time, I said, you know what I'm doing now? I said, you can't tell those guys. And I said, the only thing I know is this. When I look at somebody, I say, are you one? Are you one? And I began to lose faith. This became such a, a burden to me. My uh, sponsor lives about 70 miles away. And I had a lot of commitments during that time. I do speaking. I chair meetings. I do a lot of things. It was the holidays. And I, I got so bad that it felt like the skin was stretched over my skull. My nerves were about shot, and I was trying to do all these things that I had committed to do because I believe that commitment is something that's a valuable asset. And I finally got two days together when I thought I could go see my sponsor, and I called her up. And I said, i got to talk to you. i got to talk to you. And she said, I'm listening. I said, listen, this has got to be eyeball to eyeball. She said, come on up. And I might pack my clothes and went to see my sponsor. Now, I'm a firm believer in sponsorship, folks, because the two days I spent with my sponsor was a healing thing. And it, I came away feeling much better. I only tell you this because you never know what's going to come down the pike in your life. You never know what's going to happen to you. And you know, God has been good to me to help me with friends, to help me with this program, to help me achieve a few things in my life that I've wanted to achieve. But that's what this program's all about, is being able to cope with whatever is handed to you. I hope that someday all the breaches in my family will be healed. But I can only pray for it. And I can only do the only things I know how to do, which is to try to be a good person, to try to go to meetings, try to take my inventory, try to talk to God about my problems, and try to carry the message. I don't like to say such sad things, and I don't like to leave a podium saying sad things. So I'm going to tell you one little thing that I like. When I was in England three years ago, we just gotten married. My husband stayed at home. He won't go anyplace. He told everybody I was on my honeymoon. <laughs> but I was in London, and I, and I met a young couple. Uh, at an AA meeting, and they were marvelous, and I enjoyed them so much. And matter of fact, Tim called me just a few days ago. He was two years sober, and he invited me to come. He asked me, could he come to the hotel and see me, and I said yes. And then he invited me to his house, and, and I was pleased that I went to get to see him. And he lived in a housing project. He hadn't worked in seven years. London's very depressed. But the, he showed me his AA books, and they were underlined and highlighted, and everything was written on them. He showed me his tapes. He was so in, he he was such a dedicated and fervent member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I I was so impressed with him and with his wife. But one of the things he said to me was, "Oh, I like that story about the Indians." And I said, "What, what are you talking about?" He says, "You know the story in the book, the one about the Indians." And I said, I don't remember any story about Indians. He said, sure, there's a story in the book about Indians. He says, here, I'll show you. And this is what he showed me. The reason I found out later is in the, I, don't, I didn't have a third edition book, so it's only in the third edition. But I think uh, all those people like to still think that we've got cowboys and Indians here anyway. But there was a paragraph in here that I just thought a great deal of, and I'd like to share it with you. And this is the Indian talking. He says, To find work, I have traveled much. 
At every place I find AA group first. I keep it simple. Go to many meetings. Carry message to those who listen to me. To me, the program is spiritual. I feel great spirit at all meetings. And when talk to AA friends, I know peace. How, they ask me. I say, just let it happen. This sober Indian say to a sick, red-eyed alcoholic who want good medicine. Put cork in bottle. No, no drunk hopeless if he want to follow a guide along the right trail. Go to AA meetings. Listen, not just hear noise. Get sponsor and phone numbers. Call friends in AA when bad thoughts come. Let group spirit of love and understanding protect you. Take my hand. Walk with me up 12 steps of AA to peace. To Indians, I say, don't be afraid to join AA. I once hear people say only Indians crazy when drunk. <laughs> if so, AA full of Indians. <laughs> join the tribe. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.